ladies and gentlemen, this is the main event of the evening. For one, Andre. You're not good at this. Get out. Let me tell you a personal story about Vince McMahon. You just made the list. Oh, my God. Yeah. Sorry. No speak English. Tell me. Yeah. Goodbye and good night. All two. It's still real to me, damn it! <laughs> Gummy, yeah. This is the worst town I've ever been in. Hold three. The Moss covers. Three handle. Family Grenunzo. Mamma mia! And now. Unchained.media presents the B. Plus Podcast! With your host, Greg Unchained. It's me, Austin! It was me all along, Austin! Number four, Armbar! I will never retire! I still got 200 more! I got 200 more holes to lift! All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the B-Plus Podcast. I am your host, Greg Unchained. Today is Sunday, so you know what that means. It's time for all the rest. It's the weekly show where I sit down and talk about everything that happened on wrestling TV that wasn't WWE. So this week, that means Ring of Honor and Lucha Underground. Of course, there is Impact. We will cover that on the Impact Zone with Jay on Monday, because when we record our chat about Impact, it tends to go a little too long to fit into one of these episodes. So We'll talk Ring of Honor today, we'll talk Lucha Underground, I do hope to get to MLW and Championship Wrestling from Hollywood and all those sorts of things as life sort of settles down a little coming off the back of the G1. I'm still catching up on sleep, you know how it is, you've been doing it too, but let's get straight into it and talk about Lucha Underground. Now Lucha Underground this week was there, it existed, it was a show that I watched. It wasn't great, to be honest with you. I, I, I'm i a big fan of Lucha Underground. Everyone knows this. And Lucha Underground, you get, you got to really go out of your way to try to watch Lucha Underground in Australia. It's not easy to find. This week's episode had a lot of cutscenes and cinematics, which I'm normally a huge fan of. But the thing is, it's still a wrestling show. As much as it's a soap opera, as much as it's a science fiction, as much as it's a fantasy, it is still, at its heart, a wrestling show. And when the wrestling action in the ring is poor or subpar in any way, the whole show falls apart. And that's what happened this episode. Now, I don't know exactly why it felt that way. It it may be G1 fatigue hitting me once again, where I'm looking at the in-ring action and thinking this is terrible when it's actually not, it's actually serviceable. But a lot of the action in the L Dragon, Azteca Jr. and Killshot match felt kind of scattered. It didn't really feel cohesive, like they were telling a single story. And the same in the Reptile Tribe versus Son of Havoc, Killshot, and the Mac match. That match was better, but it still felt kind of haphazard and like there was no real cohesive point that they were trying to get to. Now, the show started with a cinematic, which I love. It was Antonio Cueto in his office, Cobra Moon bursts in and demands a shot at the trio's title. So the Reptile Tribe get a, a trio's match later in the night. Antonio Cueto here was hilarious. He's making reptile puns, right? It, He refers to Drago, who is a dragon, and last week left the Reptile Tribe because Johnny Mundo made a wish. That's right. Wishes, magic, dragons, they're all real. Lucha Underground, you get the picture. Anyway, Antonio Cueto was talking about how Drago was Dragon. It was hilarious. It was way funnier than it had any right to be. Just the look on his face, just how hokey it was, how tacky it was. I really enjoy it when Lucha Underground goes tacky and hokey in in, in these cutscenes. It was a lot of fun. He was very funny in this scene. So definitely, I'd say you can check this episode out for the cinematics. If you're the kind of person who likes cheesy wrestling cutscenes, you know, then Lucha Underground this week was for you. Just maybe the action wasn't great. Then we got the Rabbit Tribe in the ring. And this is probably another big reason I wasn't a huge fan of this episode is I do not like the way they've treated the Rabbit Tribe lately. So the Rabbit Tribe had a big angle where... They found the White Rabbit, and the White Rabbit basically asked them to kill a man, and now they're just sort of losing and losing and losing, and I'm sure it's building to something, but I thought the build-up was to the White Rabbit, and the White Rabbit would change things. Uh, To have them come off the back of finding the White Rabbit and becoming cold-hearted killers to just lose, 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 and sacrifice, sacrifice, it seems a little odd. 
So last week we had Mala Suerte succumb to the sacrifice to the gods match against Matanza. This time around we have Saltador, and he gets sacrificed to the gods as well. If next week they do Paul London, I don't know what to tell you, man. Like, that's ridiculous. That's the rabbit tribe gone. But a lot of people are dying this season. A lot of people are being sacrificed. I was keeping count at the beginning of the season, to be honest. I, I, I've, I've lost count. I think we're up to about 16 or 17 deaths this season. It's pretty crazy. If you include Drago disappearing into wherever he disappears to, then maybe 18. I don't know the exact number, but a lot of people are disappearing. A lot of people are being killed. A lot of people are being sacrificed. Some of them will come back in the form of other characters. I mean, Jeremiah Crane already came back as Jeremiah Snake. So that is something that Lucha Underground can do, is they can repackage characters after they die. And because it's a TV show, it's, it's just kind of, you know, it is what it is. It's not really a, a big deal to, to just throw away the character's history like that. But the way the Rabbit Tribe have been handled since Finding the White Rabbit has really upset me, and I wasn't a fan of this. So Saltador succumbs to the sacrifice of the gods. Matanza raises his hands. And you know what, Matanza, at first the sacrifice to the gods were cool, but now it's kind of looking like like they don't have anything for Matanza. You know, so they're just like, let's just have him kill some people. Because, you know, I'm sure, again, I'm sure it's building to something, but it's just kind of taken a little bit too long, and he's just kind of coming out and squashing people in 30 second matches when Jeff Cobb, the, the man who plays Matanza, is capable of so much more. I'd really like to see them actually do something there. So maybe he should go after the gift of the gods. I, I don't know. All I know is I'm not a fan of what has happened so far with the Rabbit Tribe, and I'm starting to sour on the Matanza sacrifices altogether. After that, we get Havoc backstage talking to the Mac about Killshot not liking him. And Killshot comes in and he's like, oh, I like you just fine. I just don't respect you, right? Because you just got handed these titles. I mean, you know, maybe the man you should disrespect is, is, is Fox, right? Because he disappeared, but whatever. Killshot says that uh, even though Mac and Havoc lost the Gift of the Gods championship after they you know, left him out, he's going to win it tonight. And they get real upset because they're like, look, we've got a trio's championship defense tonight but you're going out there for a, a Gift of the Gods title match. And so essentially, he's he's decided to pull double duty, and he says it's okay, though, because he's going to win, and then he's going to help them win the Trios Championship match. And then he admits that they're right. He doesn't like Son of Havoc, and then he leaves. So it, it was a good little backstage cinematic, lays some groundwork for what's to come. And then we go straight into that El Dragon Azteca Jr. Gift of the Gods title defense against Killshot. Like I said, the match didn't feel cohesive. There was a, you know a lot of... A lot of powdering to the outside of the ring just for the sake of hitting dives. I don't know. It just wasn't really my cup of tea. The match just didn't really flow to me, at least watching it. And in the end, El Dragon Azteca picks up the win and defends his title successfully. Moving on, we get a cinematic. This time, Drago is sitting around brooding. He's red again. He was green as he was in the Reptile Tribe, but now he's in his red Drago suit. And he's sitting around brooding and Aerostar approaches him and tells him like they fought hard to free him. But now he's been hiding, and he says he doesn't deserve a second chance. Because he did things as part of the Reptile Tribe that can't be forgiven. Aristar tells him it's not his fault, he was under the control of Cobra Moon, it's Cobra Moon's fault. But Drago says that, you know, he remembers enough. He doesn't remember much about what happened, but he remembers enough to know that he doesn't deserve Aristar's friendship. He says he has to go now, and they shake hands, and then the camera focuses on Aristar, and we see a flash of light, and Drago's gone. So Aristar says they'll meet again. So Aristar tends to know what's up. He tends to know a thing or two that we don't. He is a time-traveling space alien, after all. And if he says that we're going to meet Drago again, I'm sure we're going to meet Drago again. I don't think this is the last we'll see of Drago. So I'm, I'm hesitant to count him on this killed, sacrificed, left list. But he's definitely gone for a while, at least. But this was a great cinematic. It's the kind of thing I love about Lucha Underground. Drago having remorse over what happened makes perfect sense for his character. He's going to have to go on a journey to find himself to figure out what he needs to do to redeem himself in his own mind before he can come back. And I'm sure he will do that. And I'm sure we'll see him again soon. Then we get the main event. The Reptile Tribe uh, set to challenge Killshot, Son of Havoc, and the Mac for the trio's title. Killshot's nowhere to be found. You know, he just lost a match. You'd think he'd still be in the ring, maybe, and they could make their entrances. But no, he's gone, and they're out, and uh, no one knows where he is. So they start the match off two on three. Eventually, Killshot comes back out. No explanation, no fanfare, no... Nothing, really. It was just nothing. And it, again, this match, more cohesive than the previous one. They do have a story here with Killshot not trusting Son of Havoc, etc., 
but it was just a, a spot fest, a haphazard. It wasn't wasn't a great match and not what I'm looking for from Lucha Underground. A lot of the in-ring stuff has kind of dropped off this season. I feel like this season hasn't been as fantastic in match quality as some previous seasons of Lucha Underground. In the end, we get Killshot turning on Son of Havoc and not breaking up the pin when he could have. And they lose the titles after the match. Killshot taunts Havoc and hits the double stomp from the top rope. Sort of like a, this is your fault kind of thing, when really it was Killshot's fault. And everyone knows it was Killshot's fault. Question is, will Mac side with Killshot or will he side with his new friend, Son of Havoc? Or is he going to be too busy worrying about Mil Muertes? But we'll get to that. After that match, we get a main event angle. So that was the main event match, but then there's a main event angle. Cage is coming out to address the fact that he has a championship match against Pentagon Dark next week. It's a last man or machine standing match. Machine being, of course, because Cage is a machine. I'm still curious as to whether we're going to find out if he's actually a machine. Being Lucha Underground, I'm going to assume he actually is a machine. He's a cyborg. He's a robot. I hope we get to find that out. Maybe they can undo a panel on his back or something and rewire him and and take control of him. Maybe the Reptile Tribe will get involved. I don't know. I'm just throwing things at the wall because that's what Lucha Underground is sometimes. It's fantastic. Cage comes out to talk about his title match, but Pentagon Dark is not far behind. He comes out and attacks. They brawl around the arena. This also felt aimless. It felt aimless. They just... It didn't feel like two guys that hate each other and want to do anything to keep the other man down. All it felt like to me was two pro wrestlers going through the motions. Not what you want on TV, really. Not what you want in your main angle going into next week. It did not get me excited for the last man standing match. This could have been the opening to the last man standing match as opposed to being an angle on the go home. It just felt weird to me. They brawled all the way up the top to tease some spots coming off the top, but then they didn't do anything and they just brawled all the way back down and then brawled out of sight as the credits rolled. Pointless. It was really pointless and very upsetting from these two guys, especially after they'd had a match a couple weeks ago and it wasn't the best match they could have had. I expect the last man standing match to be better, but it really this this angle was terrible. After the credits, though, we get the Mac entering Antonio Cueto's office and requesting a match against Killshot. Cueto tells him he can't have a match against Killshot next week because someone has already requested a match against the Mac. That's right, you guessed it, Mil Muertes, well, Katrina on behalf of Mil Muertes, has challenged the Mac to a match, and Antonio tells him it's not just any match, for the first time ever, it's a haunted house match. And as he says this, he puts on a witch's hat that has a little spider hanging from it. You know, the kind you get from any $2 shop at Halloween time. And Antonio's just in a really uh, jovial, jokey mood at the moment, which I wonder if there's something to that, like in the wider story. Is he really happy at the moment because something's going his way with the sacrifice to the gods? What's going to happen to get us that fiery, angry Antonio that we saw at the beginning of the season? I I'm really curious to see where that's going because I don't think any of that is not deliberate. He's having a good time at the moment. And it <laughs> honestly, he's funny. I like funny Antonio Cueto. I, I like punny... Uh, tacky, cheesy Antonio Cueto. He puts on that hat, and then Mac takes the hat off him and puts it on and says, trick or treat, mother... F and then the show ends before he can finish that word. It's not PG, so I don't know why, but, you know, it's always fun uh, to tease the motherfucker but not actually drop it. It was so hokey and so cheesy, but in that really good, fun lucha underground way that makes the show what it is so every cinematic on this episode was on point just the in-ring action fell short and that damn angle between pentagon and cage was terrible so overall i'm gonna give this my first miss of the season right like this is an episode you don't really need to watch it wasn't great but if you do like the cinematics seek them out on youtube or something because i'm sure they will be somewhere and they were the most entertaining part specifically the drago and Aerostar cinematic. Now let's move on and talk about Ring of Honor. Ring of Honor this week was really good. They've started to rectify a lot of the issues that I had around the story issues and specifically the Women of Honor division having kind of no meaning and nothing to do. They're still going on with the Bully Ray being a dick storyline. I'm still not a huge fan of it, but it looks like we may be moving towards some closure. Now I'm still really unhappy with Ring of Honor. They have their Honor Reunited tour this weekend which I was going to watch because it was supposed to be on Honor Club, but then at the last minute they shifted and made an exclusive arrangement with Fight, so now I cannot watch without paying extra money. I mean, I could watch, but on principle I'm not going to, because I'm already paying you a monthly fee 
so that I can get these shows. And then you're going to just take the show away? That's ridiculous. You can't be doing that to your customers, man. And their customer service is non-existent. You send them an email and you never get a response. So it's really not good. And I have a real bone to pick with Ring of Honor at the moment. So, I mean, I I will probably talk about Honor Reunited next week, but it'll just be from results. I'm probably not going to watch it unless I can find another way to watch it, in which case, you know, I I may watch it, but I'm not paying for it. That's at the end of the day, I already pay you money each month. And this was supposed to be a part of that. You changed the deal at the last minute. I'm really unhappy about that. But let's have a look at TV for this week because TV was pretty good. So the show started with the bouncers. That's Brian Malonis and Beer City Bruiser having a match against the Briscoes, who are the Ring of Honor Tag Team Champions. As you would expect, the Briscoes get a win, a clean win, but this was a really good match overall. The Bouncers are a really good tag team, and I heard an interview with Beer City Bruiser on Chris Jericho's podcast earlier this week. He's been doing this for 15 years or so, so no surprise there that these guys have their shit together and, and can put on a good match. It was It was a really fun match to watch. Definitely recommend it. As far as tag team matches go, this was good because it it broke the mold. It wasn't isolate, hot tag, isolate, hot tag, which I really like the tag team formula. I like isolation. I like the hot tag. This was different. This was chaotic. They actually had a tag team match that didn't follow that specific formula, but still managed to be highly entertaining and make perfect sense. Uh, As compared to Lucha Underground, for example, where it was just spot to spot, this match really felt cohesive. This match really felt like it was all part of one story. Then we get Karen Q coming to the ring for a Women of Honor match. There's a picture-in-picture promo where she talks about wanting to become the number one contender. Madison Rain comes out, same thing, Kelly Klein, then Tennille Dashwood. All four women get a picture-in-picture promo while they make their entrance, which just gives us a little bit of insight to the character, where their head is at, what they're thinking, and how focused they are on becoming number one contender to challenge for Sumi Sakai's Women of Honor championship. Really, really good stuff. I love this. It's old school. It's easy. It's simple. It doesn't take long. You did it during the entrances. It took no extra time out of the TV show. But what it did do is make me care about this match, made me care about the championship, made the entire Women of Honor division stronger, and made the whole thing feel that much more important. The match itself was pretty good. Not as good as the tag team match, but it was a good match. All four women got their spots in. Madison Rain didn't seem to do much, but then she ultimately picked up the win with the rain check on Karen Q and becomes the number one contender. Sumi comes out to the stage and they stare each other down. Then we get the Cody and Nick Aldis segment where they renegotiated the terms for their all-in NWA championship match. That's where Cody decided to give Nick Aldis the ring of honor as collateral. It was a really good segment. We already saw this segment as part of the 10 Pounds of Gold YouTube series, which if you're not watching 10 Pounds of Gold, I've said it before and I'll say it again, watch 10 Pounds of Gold. It is fantastic. It's right up there with anything else in the wrestling week. It's about 10 to 15 minutes each week, and it's really helping to build Nick Aldis and build that NWA championship and brand going forward into the future. And and I'm, I'm looking for big and exciting things for the NWA out of this 10 Pounds of Gold really good show. It featured this segment last week, so I'd already talked about it, I believe. Uh, It was a good segment, basically gives some more stakes heading into the match at All In. Now the Ring of Honor is on the line, as well as the NWA Championship. And then Cody manages to throw some insults his way, like, yeah, look, I was losing to Jay Lethal, I was losing to Kenny Omega, but all you had to do was beat a 50-year-old high school gym teacher. And it's true, it's true. Nick Aldis has made the title worth it and he has gone around the world since then defending the title against other athletes and i mean the the teacher was an athlete too but not on the level of cody for sure so so cody makes a good point and it hurts and that's fun i always love it when there's a ring of truth to what someone is saying in the ring really good segment definitely worth watching i would personally watch it on 10 pounds of gold and then fast forward it on ring of honor and just get to the matches the main event match cheeseburger josh woods and Flip Gordon versus Bully Ray, Shane Taylor, and Punishment Martinez. Now, I've talked before about being sick of the Bully Ray storyline, so I'm not really going to go too much into it. It's a terrible storyline. It doesn't feel like it has any payoff. The big payoff so far has been Colt Cabana, who doesn't need any help getting over and doesn't even wrestle technically in Ring of Honor anymore. I'm not sure what the deal is there, but he's a commentator. Why are we putting him over at the expense of these guys that are falling to Bully Ray? Anyway, Flip Gordon gets attacked from behind before the match by Bully Ray. We go to commercial, we come back, and then Cheeseburger and Josh Woods agree to make it a two-on-three match. Stupid. 
Uh, but, you know, it is what it is. They get the crap beaten out of them for a while, and Colt Cabana ultimately comes down and gets involved. Shane Taylor ends up picking up the win from behind on Cheeseburger with all the distractions going on at ringside. And then they all beat down Colt Cabana, Flip Gordon comes back out with a chair to make the save. Again, the storyline I'm getting sick of, but it does feel like we're actually moving towards some closure with Colt Cabana involved and hopefully Flip Gordon playing a bigger role and actually managing to overcome Bully Ray this time. Now, like I said before, I'm not going to talk about the Honor Reunited stuff. It's happening at the moment. I think the first show has already happened as I'm recording this. By the time you hear this, all three shows will have happened, but I haven't had a chance to check anything out as of now. If the Honor Reunited stuff gets addressed, it'll get addressed on next week's All The Rest episode, so make sure you hit that subscribe button so you can get the notification when All The Rest hits next week if you want to know what happened at Honor Reunited. But for now, let's take a look at This Week in Wrestling News. Alright, so This Week in Wrestling News, we're going to have a, a bit of a quick one, because today is, as I record this Saturday, and I have a roller derby game to get to in less than 20 minutes. So. I'm going to try to rush through this, get dressed, and then get out the door to go to a roller derby game. I'm just going to pick a couple of top stories. Obviously, there's a lot that happens in the world of wrestling news. Now, we do have to talk about the Jeff Jarrett and Impact lawsuit, but I'll probably talk about that with Jay on Monday's Impact Zone. So if you want to hear more about the lawsuit, tune in to Impact Zone. There's a lot of news this week around All In and some new people being added. That stuff will go on our All In, All In cast, which is going to drop later in the week, where we're going to talk about All In with all the B-plus players. So we'll get some hot takes there about all the new people that have been added to All In. I'm saying all a lot. So other than that, those things will be discussed on other podcasts throughout the week. Let's have a look at the things that I am choosing to discuss on this week's All The Rest. First up, something that will be discussed on the ProRes podcast when it comes out is the World Wonder Ring Stardom five-star Grand Prix tournament. It's kind of the Stardom's version of the G1. The lineup this year is fantastic. I'm really looking forward to it. It actually starts today. I will be watching it later tonight when I get home from the Derby. We've got Kagetsu, Jungle Kiona, Tam Nakano, Konami, Katsuko Tora, Utami Hayashishita, and Rachel Ellering and Kimba Lee. So Rachel Ellering and Kimber Lee being in there is fantastic. Kagetsu, uh, Jungle Kiona, the, the lineup is strong. It's a really strong lineup. And if you aren't watching Stardom, it is arguably the best women's promotion in the world. I'd put Pro Wrestling Eve right up there as well. Of course, there's Shimmer. You can't go past Shimmer. But Stardom is brutal, hard-hitting, strong-style women's athletes. And this is their version of the G1. It starts today. You can sign up for Stardom World. It's in Japanese, so you kind of need to get the Google Chrome Translate feature to do a bit of the work for you. But Stardom World is a really good deal. I think it's like $8 Australian a month in the end. And you'll get access to all of these to all of these five-star Grand Prix shows. So definitely worth checking out the five-star Grand Prix starting this week. And I'm sure I will be talking about that with Arnold Furious come time for the This Month in ProRes podcast. Now, in other news this week, Chris Jericho has posted a cryptic tweet about being a free agent in 2019. He says that it's going to be a very exciting year. I think it's safe to say at this point we're going to see him go to Impact. Hopefully he'll show up at an all-in show if they do a second all-in. It would even be really cool to see him at the Garden for Ring of Honor in New Japan, defending that Intercontinental Championship. There's a lot of things Chris Jericho can do. He's, he's been a part of this opening up the wrestling world and making it more free which I really love. It's really exciting. Even Daniel Bryan was talking about it this week in his interview with Sam Roberts and a few other places on, on YouTube and what have you. A few Daniel Bryan interviews were dropped this week. And he was talking about how he would love to do the Chris Jericho thing and have a more open contract that allows him to, yes, compete in some of his dream matches he still has for WWE, but also to go around the world and do other things like Jericho has done. That's what I want too. I want that to happen too. I hope WWE let up the reins a little bit and let their guys do that because there's a lot of money to be made. There's a lot of attention to be had and it helps the wrestling business as a whole to have that kind of thing happen. So while we're talking about Daniel Bryan, obviously, as I said, he was on the Sam Roberts podcast this week and he did say there's a 90 plus percent chance of him re-signing. He doesn't want to work 200 plus dates a year anymore. He only wants to work 50 to 100 matches. 
which honestly at his stage in his career is perfectly reasonable and he could do it and still make a lot of money for the company so they would be insane to not let him do that hopefully there's a provision that lets him go elsewhere and do other matches but i doubt we're at that point yet would be really nice if it happens if they won't compromise and bring him down to those amount of dates he'll definitely be able to do those amount of dates on the indies and still make a good amount of money so I think Daniel Bryan has all the options in the world right now, and the world is his oyster, and we as fans are going to be spoiled either way with Daniel Bryan. as a, He's he's one of the best in the world uh, at the end of the day. He is close to being the best in the world, and he will have good matches no matter where he goes. His stuff on SmackDown has been fantastic. You know, I mean, even Big Cass, he carried Big Cass to some passable matches. As terrible as the story was, the in-ring stuff that we watch Daniel Bryan for is fantastic, and, and I'm looking forward to seeing what happens. In other contractual news, Rey Mysterio has been pulled from some local indie shows in August and September, leading some to speculate on his all-in status. I don't think he's going to be pulling out of all-in. I'm pretty sure all-in's a very big deal. There's a lot of eyes on it. It would not be a good look for him or for WWE to be pulling him from that show. The rumors, of course, are that he is headed to WWE where he will make a return shortly after the all-in show. I fully expect him to be at all-in. I doubt he would do that to the guys, especially with the amount of eyes on the all-in product as there are. Now, in addition to Rey Mysterio, Pentagon and Phoenix have been pulling out of dates as well, leading to ramped-up speculation that they're heading to WWE as well. Would be really cool to see them show up on 205 Live. Would be really cool to see all three guys show up on 205 Live. Uh, definitely willing to see where it goes. I don't think Rey Mysterio is going to end up on 205 Live, but it should be uh, interesting to see. I mean, the WWE roster is stacked at the moment, so trying to figure out where Rey Mysterio is going to fit in is kind of kind of interesting. And Pentagon as well, Phoenix, are they going to go to NXT? Will they go straight to 205 Live? Is there something else that they have in mind? It's a, it's a curious situation. I think WWE are getting too overloaded on talent. We talked about this last week when we talked about them being interested in Shane Strickland as well. They're overloading at this point, and, and I think it's time to sort of do some things with the guys you've got before you start adding more and more and more just to play keep away. Now, the last two stories I want to talk about this week, I'm going to give a little bit of a warning here. You know, if uh, politicization of wrestling is not your thing, if sexual harassment allegations are off-putting to you in any way, no matter what side of the aisle you stand on. Now is the time to tune out. Thank you very much for listening. Like, share, subscribe, all of that. But if those things are triggering to you in any way, now is the time to go, because I'm going to talk about it. We've got Randy Orton has been accused of sexual misconduct. Essentially, the allegations surfaced on a podcast from years ago, and someone dug it up and this whole digging things up from the past is really frustrating. That said, what Randy Orton is alleged to have done has never been acceptable. I mean, I get guys doing guy things in a locker room, like locker room jokes. and I, I guess when Trump used that defense, he got in a lot of trouble. Oh, it was just locker room talk. No one talks like that in locker rooms. Yeah, they do. People talk like that in locker rooms, okay? I mean, I've not been around a lot of locker rooms, but I know that when you get a group of rowdy guys together talk can be pretty feral sometimes it really can and and to say it's not i mean you're just to say you've never heard talk like that you just you're straight up lying or you've never been around uh, dudes and even girls man i've heard some feral talk come from groups of girls that are together too like in, in a similar situation so it's it's just one of those things man like people people are gross at the end of the day and yeah we need to try to be better but we also need to acknowledge the fact that it just kind of happens sometimes, and in certain settings, in certain situations, in certain contexts, it's okay. In a work context, that is never okay. So what he is alleged to have done, obviously, is new writers being brought into the writing team, and he will whip out his dick and ask them to shake his hand after he touches himself, and his dick is just hanging out, and he's like, hey, shake my hand, and whether they shake his hand or not, and... and ex writers and stuff uh, on Twitter have just been joking about it. Like, no, I would never shake his hand, but no one's actually straight out confirmed it. At a recent live event, I think it was at SmackDown, after the show went off the air, there was a dark match with Randy Orton, and he came out to ringside and was offering to shake the bell ringer's hand and the timekeeper's hand and all that sort of stuff. So they were kind of making jokes about it. And look, if it really happened, it's pretty disgusting. And that you're going out there and joking about it, 
that's even worse. Now, some people are going to say, look, it's just they're just playing around. It's a an in-joke and it's okay. And that's fine. Like, I'm, I'm sure some of the people were okay with the in-joke and were like, haha, Randy, you're, you're such a clown. But I'm sure other people were genuinely put off by it. And, and that's an awkward situation to put someone in, in a work context. Again, it's all about context, right? Like, if you're... If you're hanging out with your mates on the weekend and you do something stupid and ridiculous like that in a group of friends, sure. But in a work context, I mean, it's a little strange. It's it's a weird power thing of, like, I'm Randy Orton. I don't know. It's it's really awkward. And, yeah, it, everyone's been kind of silent on it, which I'm going to get to in a minute, which kind of pisses me off. But to then just go out to the ring and be joking about it seems a little classless. WWE are supposedly looking into it, but... In all honesty, it's Randy Orton. I don't think anything's going to come of this. Guy should lose his job. I'm not. I'm the last person to call for a person losing their job over, you know, allegations and what have you. I, I'm all for due process. They definitely need to investigate. But if this is true and he's doing this or has done this in the past, like, that is disgusting and he should definitely lose his job. I'm sorry. I, I'm not one to do that, but he, he should lose his job over that because it's gross. Moving on, the other big news story this week was Dave Meltzer. I wanted to have Mikey on the show to talk about this, but unfortunately, because of my commitments to go to the roller derby and his commitments with his family things, we were unable to line up to talk about this. But I know Mikey has a different point of view to me. He's a big Meltzer mark, as he has self-described himself repeatedly. And he's been really defensive over what's happened this week. And I kind of see where he's coming from. So Meltzer, for those who don't know, Meltzer on one of his Wrestling Observer radio shows talked about Peyton Royce and Billy Kay and how they don't really do anything for him since they came up to SmackDown, how they were better in NXT, their whole act seemed better. And he referred to Peyton's attractiveness. Now, why her attractiveness comes into how you're rating her work, I do not know. I mean, and people are going to hate on me for this because they're like, oh, of course they need to be attractive. I, I don't think so, you know? There's all, all different kinds of workers. Yes, the look is important, having a look. But you can have a look without being the look, if that makes sense. So we talked about it with Shazza McKenzie, right? You don't have to have that model look to have a look. Karma has a look, you know? Braun Strowman has a look, and Finn Balor has a look, right? Finn Balor's more likely to be on ladies' calendars than Braun Strowman. Oh, some some people that would like the Braun Strowman thing. But what I'm saying is, there is no one look. And Dave Meltzer, brother, you are nothing. You are me. You are the same as me. You are just a person with a microphone. You're just a person who's been doing it long enough that you've fooled people into thinking that you're special, right? Now, I, I mean, I, I feel bad saying that because like I'm doing the same thing, right? I'm just talking into a microphone. I'm just writing on a website. I'm just oh, we're fans. You're not even a journalist, man. You're a fan that watches wrestling, that talks about it. And at, at no point should what a, at no point should what Peyton Royce looks like factor into how you analyze her work. I, I don't know. Maybe maybe it does factor in for some people. But at the end of the day, who gives a shit what you think, right? Who gives a shit? I don't know why so many people care. And then, but even worse than that. Yeah, he, he made a stupid call. He said that she was lighter in NXT, and he liked that better. Now, apparently that was a joke because she got breast implants. I didn't even realize she'd gotten breast implants, so it shows you how much attention I've been paying. But apparently she got breast implants, and he's making a joke about how she was lighter in NXT, and that made him more aroused. No one cares what you get off to, dude, and it doesn't play into how you should judge her ring work. Peyton Royce and Billy Kay are highly entertaining. I'm biased because I've been watching them since they were at PWA in Sydney, you know, with a room of 60 or 70 other people watching them wrestle. And they're some of my favorite people in the wrestling world. And so I'm like, uh, I do come to their defense a little, but at the same time, it's just, it's, it's so pathetic that that plays into you and that you think that what you have to say about what she looks like even matters. Then even worse is all the people attacking him. So he immediately came out and was like, Look, I apologize. I understand. His apology was bullshit, though, because his apology was like, look, Peyton, I'm very sorry. You are an exceedingly attractive woman. You missed the point, dude. No one cares if you think she's attractive or not. No one cares if you think she's attractive or not. That's not the point. The point here is that you thinking her attractiveness comes into it at all. That's the point. That's what you should be apologizing for is 
thinking that her attractiveness even matters when you're talking about her as a wrestler. It was ridiculous. So, end of the day, everyone jumps to either attack or defend the dude when he was wrong, but also the people attacking are wrong too, because he did apologize. Even though the apology was bullshit, we can call him on the bullshit apology and say, look, that apology was bullshit, and then he can fix his apology, make it better, and we can move on, right? Like, he actually does seem like he wants to learn from it. He posted about that multiple times, like, this is a situation we can all learn from. Specifically you, Dave, you need to learn from this. But everyone attacking him, right? Everyone just being like, oh, is so... and they all pile on like it's so easy. Where were all of you two days ago when people are talking about Randy Orton whipping his dick out? I mean, this is just a dude saying that someone's unattractive or attractive, right? On the other story, you got a guy whipping his dick out, touching himself, and trying to shake hands with people, and y'all are completely silent on that? And then you want to go on the high road, like, oh, we're such great people jumping to the defense of poor Peyton Royce, who, by the way, she dragged him through the mud on her own. She didn't need any help from all y'all. Like, everyone is jumping on it. Like, minus six stars, Dave, says Seth Rollins. Like, it was all bullshit. Like, everyone's jumping on it. Like, they're so great and so mighty to attack this guy on the outside who has no power over them whatsoever. But then Randy Orton's there sexually harassing people on your staff, and you're all fucking silent? Grow up here, man. Talk about the stuff that actually matters as opposed to just some idiot's opinion on the internet. God damn. All right, I'm getting all fired up. I got three minutes left. I got to go to the derby. I have to somehow shower and get dressed in three minutes. So thank you very much for listening. This has been all the rest. It's a bit of a short one today, just due to time constraints for me and my personal life. But thank you very much for listening, you guys. This thing has been growing really rapidly and it's all thanks to your support. So keep hitting that like button. Keep hitting that share button. Give us a five-star review on iTunes. You know where to find us. Thank you so much for listening. Hold one. Arm drag. You're not doing this. Get out. Let me tell you a personal story about Vince McMahon. You just made the list. Oh, my God. So, no speak English. Dummy. Yeah. Goodbye and good night. Hold two. Arm bar. This is the worst town I've ever been in. It's still real to me, damn it. Coming. Yeah. Hold three. The moss covered.